so kind of piggybacking on um, the previous lecture that we just did, really honing in on the concepts associated with those different pressures that we talked about, especially those last four slides where we were talking about if you have an elevated this pressure, then it means that this is happening. Um, just really taking you guys through that conceptually so that you can understand it a little bit easier. This is a PowerPoint, um, and this is going to kind of synapse for you guys everything you have to know about heart failure. And heart failure, again, if you're just circling back to meeting the body's metabolic needs, if, you have, uh, if your heart is failing, you are not meeting the body's metabolic needs. Um, just really want to solidify that concept. So this is where we're going to kind of chunk it up. This is everything you need to know about heart failure. Um, heart failure is much more detailed than this. Uh, you are going to learn it in more detail in classes later on in this program. But for right now, this is the detail that you have to know heart failure for this exam and for my class. If we're talking about systolic heart failure, then we are going to be talking about failure of the heart to contract effectively. This is going to affect the heart's ability to eject blood out into the lungs and the body. Again, imagine those ventricles. Um, they should be able to contract strongly and forcefully to eject that blood out into the lungs and the body. So if there was an issue where they were not able to do that, that's going to affect your cardiac output. It's going to impede the forward flow of blood, causing a backup of blood, um, which is known as congestion. So this is um, a contractility issue. If you have diastolic heart failure, this would be a failure of the heart to relax effectively. This is going to affect the heart's ability to fill. It's going to impede the volume of blood in the forward flow and ejection. So this is going to be a preload or end diastolic volume issue. So again, preload is that relaxed state where that heart is filling with its blood volume. And that's the blood volume that it can um, then eject into the lungs or in the heart. So if you had an issue with the filling of the heart, this would be a preload issue. If you had increased vascular resistance, and there's many things that can cause that, you would have a failure of the heart caused by elevated resistance. The heart has to work harder to get blood out to the lungs and out to the body, and there would be an increased impedance to that blood flow. So this would be an afterload issue, okay? So I'm trying to break it down, circle back to that preload, contractility, afterload that you guys learned about, all of which affect stroke volume. And stroke volume is the amount of blood that your ventricles can get into your lungs and in your heart. Um, the other thing I just want to highlight here is anytime you have a patient with chest pain, this is true in clinical practice and on the boards, if there's a mention of chest pain ever, 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 you put them on supplemental oxygen. It does not matter if their saturations are 99%, you put them on supplemental oxygen. If there's the potential for you to have some sort of issue in um, cardiac output where you do not have um, good perfusion meeting the body's metabolic needs, they are gonna want you to put them on supplemental oxygen to try to compensate for that potential failure. Okay, so right-sided heart failure. If you're talking about the right side of the heart failing, then what you're going to be talking about is blood not being able to get into the lungs. And again, if you haven't learned your circulation and you're trying to watch this PowerPoint, just stop, go learn your circulation, and then come watch it. If you have right-sided heart failure, blood is not going to be able to get into the lungs. It's going to back up into the body. So in these patients with right-sided heart failure, you often see a peripheral edema, which just means it's like a swelling of <clears throat> their legs and their feet. Um, and it's because basically that volume is almost like backing up because you always want that forward blood flow. If for some reason the right side of the heart is failing, you're going to get a backing up of that volume, a backing up of that fluid. It's going to dump back into that venous system. So you usually see um, people who are system, uh, symptomatic with right-sided heart failure usually see a peripheral edema. What you will see for pressures from me for your exam is that they will have an elevated CVP or right atrial pressure. That's the big one. And then they'll either have a normal or low pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. When you guys do practice these in, in the patient case scenarios that I'm going to do for extra credit for class and for your exam, I do try to make it very clear what is going on. 
But this is um, your flashcard for right-sided heart failure. This is what you need to know. For left-sided heart failure, you would have a situation where blood would not be able to get into the body because the left side of the heart is what is pumping the blood into the systemic circulation. Your blood will back up into the left atrium and into the lungs. Okay, so this is going to cause a pulmonary edema. So patients that have left-sided heart failure um, consistently have issues where fluid almost backs up into their lungs and they have pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema. Mm, based on what we know about Fick's Law, um, that is really impactful for their oxygenation because if you have fluid in your lungs that's not meant to be there, it increases your AC membrane thickness, it decreases your surface area for that diffusion. It also can do things to your compliance by washing out your surfactant and making that surface tension higher. Um, so it's not something that you want for a variety of reasons. These patients, if they go into something called flash pulmonary edema, where their left-sided heart failure, let's say they are not being compliant with their diet or their medications that they use to kind of keep their left-sided heart failure in check, um, they can have something called flash pulmonary edema where they get a lot of fluid in their lungs very, very quickly. And this is a patient that uh, you will serve uh, as a respiratory therapist. And it literally feels like <clears throat> drowning. They get very tachypnic, uh, very labored breathing. Their oxygen will drop. And we have to give them something called Lasix, a diuretic, to help get that fluid out. We also treat them with um, CPAP and BiPAP, which you guys will learn about later. I'm going a little bit on a tangent. But basically, if your left side of your heart is failing, that fluid, that volume of blood is going to back up into your lungs. You would also see an increase in pulmonary pressure. And the reason why that's going to happen is if you have this blood backing up into your lungs, it's going to create more pressure, right? So it's almost going to create a blockage um, for more blood coming into your lung. So you're going to see this elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And the reason that that's the pressure that you're going to see change is because your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is um, basically that left atrial pressure, but it tells us a lot about that left ventricle. So it'll be elevated because this is a situation where it's having a hard time getting blood um, out to the body. So your left ventricle is what's responsible for getting that blood out to your body. So you'll have an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and you will have a low cardiac output. Again, it makes sense if you follow it back through. If you can't get blood out to the body, because your afterload is really high or whatever the issue is, if you can't get blood out to the body, you would have a low cardiac output. You're not ejecting blood out to the body. You're going to have a low cardiac output. So those are the two things you will see if I want you to describe it as left-sided heart failure. Okay, so when we're talking about increased vascular, or vascular resistance, that's the resistance to blood flow. So if you have increased systemic vascular resistance, that means you're increasing the afterload it's hard for the left ventricle to get blood out to the body. So you will know that systemic vascular resistance is increased if you have an elevated SVR. So there's a normal range for systemic vascular uh, resistance. If it's elevated, you should be able to recognize that. You will have an elevated PCWP. And the reason why you will have an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is because that is what is showing us the average pressure for the left ventricle. Your systemic vascular resistance is going to be um, showing you that your left ventricle is having to work harder than it should have to work. You're going to see that in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. You'll also see an elevated MAP, okay? An elevated mean arterial pressure. And that's because, again, it's all working harder, and that's going to elevate those pressures. So over time, an increased systemic vascular resistance is going to lead to left heart failure. If your left ventricle is constantly having to work harder than it needs to, right? It's constantly having to contract harder. Um, it's constantly meeting all of this increased systemic vascular resistance. It's going to eventually fail. Uh, you don't really have to understand the reasons why. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this ends up happening. You just have to kind of know that if it's having to work harder over and over and over again, that's going to cause it to fail. If you're talking about increased pulmonary vascular resistance or PVR, that's going to be where it's hard for the right ventricle to get blood into the lungs. So in a situation where you have increased pulmonary vascular resistance, you would see an elevated PVR. You have a normal range for that. It would be outside of the normal range. 
you'd have an elevated CVP or right atrial pressure. And again, if your right ventricle is not able to get blood out because it's meeting more resistance, that's going to back up into your right atrium. So that's where you would see this elevated CVP. You're going to see an elevated pulmonary arterial pressure, right? And that's because this is where your pulmonary vascular resistance essentially is going to be. Um, your pulmonary artery is where your right ventricle is trying to get blood into. So you're going to see an elevated PAP and you'll see an elevated MPAP, um, which is just your mean pulmonary arterial pressure. Over time, increased pulmonary vascular resistance will lead to right-sided heart failure. This right-sided heart failure in, is specifically called core pulmonale. We have you guys as respiratory therapists learn about core pulmonale because this is something that is very common in people who have chronic respiratory diseases. Um, and I will kind of talk about why. So if you have right-sided heart failure caused by a chronic hypoxemic pulmonary disease, your core pulmonale. And the reason that it's specifically um, caused by a pulmonary disease is you right, the right side of your heart could fail for different reasons, right? This is specifically saying that the right side of your heart failed because you're chronically hypoxemic from a pulmonary disease. So the reason that this happens is if you're chronically hypoxemic, so that means you have low oxygen, low PO2, it causes pulmonary vasoconstriction. Now we talked about this with those capillaries and that smooth muscle sphincter and how they don't let blood go to alveoli that are not um, participating in gas exchange. They don't go to areas with shitty ventilation or bad ventilation. So if you have low oxygen, you have this pulmonary vasoconstriction and it's doing that because it's trying to direct blood towards areas that have good pressure of oxygen um, that can participate in gas exchange. Well, when you're vasoconstricting, you're going to increase pressure and you're going to create something called pulmonary hypertension, right? Now, what do we know about our pulmonary uh, circulation? It is a low pressure system, right? Gravity dependent, low resistance system in a healthy individual. So if you now all of a sudden have this high pulmonary pressure because of all this vasoconstriction, that's going to cause a problem for your right ventricle. If it's having, if your right ventricle is having to work harder to get the blood from your right ventricle into your lungs, then that means that you're going to start to see that right side of your heart fail. And if you remember, your right side of your heart is not your muscular side, right? It's only designed to put blood from your heart to your lungs. So that's not that far. It's a low pressure system. It's not very muscular. If all of a sudden your right ventricle is really having to work hard against a pressure to try to put blood into your lungs, it's going to start to fail, okay? So pulmonary hypertension and increased pulmonary vascular resistance is going to cause this right-sided heart failure. So it basically increases the demand on the right ventricle to get blood, blood into the lungs. It makes that right ventricle have to work harder. So definitely understand that definition and understand why it occurs in hypoxemic um, diseases. The other heart issue that I want you guys to know about is something called cardiac tamponade. And this is an increased fluid buildup in that pericardial cavity of the heart. So it's basically that um, cardiac effusion that we were talking about. You have that serous and parietal um, layer and then that um, kind of space in between with the fluid to decrease the friction when the heart is beating. There are times that more fluid gets in there and that's called cardiac tamponade. When you have the fluid go in that space, it'll start to compress down on the heart and make it harder for the heart to fill and um, compromise the heart's ability to function as a pump. So that's where they would come in with a needle and drain that fluid out, and that's cardiac tamponade. That's all you have to know about it is what's on this slide. And that is it. And you again, you guys are going to start getting patient case scenarios as we closer to this lecture where I show you exactly how this is going to be applied in a patient case scenario so you feel confident that you, that you know the level to which you have to understand these. And that is it.